Okay, let's see, we've got people joining. So uh, today we've got Dave Marsh talking to us about making success possible in our complex world, which is gonna be exciting here. I'm looking forward, really looking forward to hearing this. Um, so that's what we're doing today, but let me give you an overview of what we got coming up. Uh, next week, we're gonna be talking about agile, identifying double agents, counter espionage for agile teams. And we're gonna be looking at um, some stories from uh, World War II, uh, probably one of the most successful double agents of, of all time. And, um, and then kind of turn that around and ask ourselves, if we had a double agent on our team whose goals weren't necessarily aligned with um, wh how we were defining success, would we actually know that? Or even maybe more to the point, if we were doing things that were counterproductive, was there a way that we would uh, be able to recognize those types of behaviors in ourselves? Um, so that's gonna be fun. I've been writing this talk uh, this this past week and got some really interesting uh, facts and history things from World War II, as well as some good takeaways for Agile. And then the week after that, we're gonna be looking at behavior-driven development with robots. So this is gonna be fun. We're gonna take a robot and walk through the uh, the behavior development process, including writing the code, writing the tests and everything um, to program this robot. So you'll be different than what you normally experience when writing code you know in java or something like that but it should be a lot of fun and we're going to find a way to create a test for the different things we need to do and then put it together to help this uh, robot navigate a maze um, so that'll be coming up in two weeks if if you have people who are interested in behavior driven development even if they're not developers this is a really really good chance for them to kind of get to see the whole pro process in a in in simplified terms to understand how the interactions really work Okay, and so uh, with that, uh, I will going to turn it over to Dave. I, I worked with Dave uh, years ago. Um, I think it was 2011 is when we first met and uh, learned a tremendous amount from him. And it was great, great experience uh, for, for me. And so I was very excited that he agreed to uh, do this talk. So I will go ahead and stop sharing here. And Dave, I will turn it over to you. Okay, well, thanks a lot, Mark. And uh, welcome, everybody. Um, it's great to be here. A little nervous to be in the house of Mark Shedd speaking, I will be honest, um, but um, uh, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, I will say that um, if you have any questions at all uh, during, the, during the talk or any comments, please put them in the WebEx chat, and uh, Mark is going to be looking and uh, moderating that chat. And if anything comes up that he thinks is interruptible, is worth, worth an interruption, he'll interrupt and then we'll, we'll address it. Um, the deck that I'm going to share, I'll make it available. Um, I don't know, I guess I'll give it to you, Mark, and then you can make it available on the site. Um, and there will be a quiz at the end of the presentation today. And uh, the winner of the of the quiz will win a book and we'll talk about what the book is. Um, so that's that's all the housekeeping to start. Let me let me share my screen and I'll start presenting. All right, so this, this notion of making success possible in our complex world, as soon as I, I sort of brought this up um, last week, somebody actually said that's a really ambiguous topic. And it is a bit ambiguous, right? It's a bit ambiguous. So what does it mean? So here's, here's the purpose of the session. Um, so we all know that it's incredibly stressful when we're, we're tasked with solving these wicked and complex problems, wicked, Really, we have a lot of stakeholders to satisfy. Complex, I'll talk about, about what complex means in a little bit. And we're also using some kind of product that we don't know if it's a good fit or not for the problems we're solving. So I want to really focus on how we can reduce that stress. Um, to do that, we're going to explore complexity and what it takes to deal with it. And you know, this is all very theoretical to start, but um, towards the end of the presentation, I'll give you some concrete techniques that you can use within your own organization, first of all, to create the kind of teams that are adaptable, high, high performing, and very resilient to adversity, because really, that's the fundamental part of this. Um, we all know that we're, as people, we're the ones creating the solutions to these problems. It's all about how we work together and how we handle adversity and, and, and what is being thrown at us as we're trying to solve complex problems. And then some techniques for how those teams can generate value by creating adaptive solutions for, compl for the complex problems. So that's the purpose of the session. Now, I just, wanna, I just wanna start with a little game. And Mark's gonna share the link in the chat. This game is called the 5S game. 
It's only going to take four minutes to play, probably less. You're going to be presented with a board that looks like this to start, and there are four rounds. Um, don't give up on the first round. It is very difficult on the first round. It's going to be better if you have a mouse. If you have a trackpad, you can try. You won't get as many of, of these, but um, the goal is to click through the tiles from 1 to 50 in 30 seconds, and you get four rounds to do it. And the five S's, you'll see what those five S's. Oh, someone can't hear me properly. Can is that true of everyone? Okay. The audio is coming through okay for me. So I think it's okay. I think it's working well. It may just okay. be on their end. Um, okay. if you have the invite and you're having trouble hearing, you actually can call in uh, on telephone lines. So you can look for that too. Okay. Thank you. So so please go ahead and um, play this game. And when you're done, um, post your, your round results to the chat. So there are four rounds, so something like this. I've got 6, 15, 36, 45. Post to the chat, and then we'll know when, when most of you are done and we can move on. And then we're gonna, we're gonna take a look at this game later. So I'm just gonna be quiet and let you play this game called the five S's. And if you're just joining the meeting, um, there is a link in the chat, um, and if maybe it has to be reposted, but we're just going to start off by playing this game called the 5S game. You can just follow the instructions in the game. It's quite, it's quite self-evident, but you've got to read the instructions. Okay, so Bize, you had 339. Um, that you should have one more number. There are four rounds to the game. Okay. All right, Kevin, thank you. That looks good. Although you got more the first time than the second time. That's interesting. Okay, thank you, Rocky. That's that's a good that's a good progression. Thanks, Astrid. And Roy, that's very, yeah, very interesting. Jeff, it doesn't surprise me you didn't get 50 at the end. Sorry, that's, that's kind of mean. Okay. Okay, looking good. And for those of you just joining, everybody else is playing this game. We're going to move on um, once, once people have played and have, have gotten the answers. Um, interesting zero that the, for the first time, it's very tricky the first time, isn't it? So we're just playing this game and we're going to move on in, in about two minutes. All right, John, so a lot easier the last time. And Jose, that's interesting. We'll have to talk about that. Mm. So, you know, I just saw Amy's, I get the feeling that that third round 
is a bit confusing from a user experience perspective with everything broken up into the squares. So we can talk about that too when we get to that point in the presentation. All right, are we, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna move on. I'm hoping that, that most of you have finished. Okay, so Mark, you're gonna share the game link. Um, am I okay to move on? Any thumbs up or just let me know, okay. Okay, let's, let's move on. So you might be finishing the game, but um, let's, we're gonna talk about why we played that game later on in the session. So what I do want to talk about, though, we, when we talk about complexity and we talk about how do we deal with complexity, I'd like to explore this, this historical example. Um, so I wasn't alive for this, but John F. Kennedy uh, at Congress proposed that, that the United States should commit to achieving the goal before the decade is out of landing a moon, a man on the moon, and returning him safely to Earth. Now that's a little bit sexist, but you know, a human being, it would have been nice if he'd said that, but um, so that's what he said in, in 1961. And imagine if we'd followed a traditional approach to achieving that goal, which by the way, is a pretty clear vision, right? So let's talk about how we would do it. And I've, I'm using Winston Royce's paper, the first page of his paper, in which he described this approach that later became known as the waterfall if we'd started with system requirements and gone to software requirements and then you know gone through all the way to, to testing and operations we would have done that once and there's a picture of buzz aldrin um taken by neil armstrong on the moon it would have happened once now i think we all know that it wasn't possible to do that and so what did nasa do well they already had the Mercury missions running at the time that, that John F. Kennedy said that, and they had proven that astronauts could fly in space. Now, they, nobody had, had been in space for more than 34 hours, but they'd proven that you could be, that astronauts could fly in space. But what they didn't know, look at all these things they didn't know. Can humans survive weightlessness for two weeks? Can two spacecraft dock in space? Um, can we conduct the EVAs, the extravehicular uh, activity? Can we land? Because, you know, with, with Mercury, they were splashing down in the ocean. How can we land on, there's no ocean on the moon. There's a lot of radiation, the Van Allen belts, the cosmic radiation, cosmic rays, the, the radiation from the sun. Can we survive all of that? And what about micrometeoroids that are flying around at, at high speed? Will they puncture the spacecraft skin? So. Um, they actually used a different project called Pegasus, uh, where they launched satellites up to measure the velocity and the, and the impact of, of those me micrometeorites. But they had a lot, of, a lot of problems to overcome, a lot of obstacles to overcome. And so they actually invented the Gemini, I, I would pronounce it Gemini, but I know they pronounce it Gemini, um, the Gemini mission, um, just to answer all of these questions before they could actually send a Saturn V into space with an Apollo crew and have them land on the moon. So it's very interesting that they did that. It wasn't, it wasn't a waterfall approach. It was a much more iterative and incremental approach. Um, and, and you're right, Mark, there's a lot that they didn't know. And I'll tell you, they, they knew that they didn't know these things, but there were many things that they didn't know that they didn't know, and they learned as they did these things. So for example, um, the EVAs, they thought, okay, we've got our spacesuits, we're gonna be fine. Well, it turns out that the astronauts became overheated and exhausted, and they had to change the whole parameters of, of the EVA missions. Um, and Mitten's saying it's incredible that it all worked. It is incredible that it all worked so quickly, right? Um, so, so this is my inspiration for talking about complexity and talking about the way I like to coach Agile teams. And I think that the way that Agile organizations um, could work. Um, so, Going to use here a couple of different models. I'm using them a little bit inappropriately, but I'll, I'll explain why in a second. Not inappropriate, just just use, simplifying them a little bit. the The chart on the left is is the basis for what's known as the Stacy complexity matrix or the Stacy complexity model. So if you think of the y-axis as requirements, whether they're 
close to agreement, which is very close to the, the vertex, uh, up to far from agreement, um, and then on the, on the x-axis, technology, close to certainty, far from certainty, um, and then the people. Are the people involved in this work that we're doing close to agreement or certainty or far from agreement and far from certainty? So if you think about being in this corner, we have quite a simple or a clear problem. So we know what our requirements are. We're using technology we've used before. We're all in agreement as to what the objectives of this work uh, are. And so we've got quite a simple or clear problem to solve, right? So I worked, for example, uh, at ExxonMobil in Thailand. There were teams who were implementing uh, payroll changes uh, across the globe. And they were using SAP, and they knew exactly where to make the changes, so they knew the technology. The requirements coming out were quite clear from the different governments around the world. Uh, as to what needed to change, these deductions changing by a certain amount. Um, and so they, they knew, and, they, and they'd worked together for a while, so they knew exactly what they needed to do, and it was quite a simple and a clear problem. Now, maybe we get into situations that are a little more complicated. For example, um, I've seen teams recently move from one CRM solution to Salesforce, for example, and nobody really knew Salesforce. They knew what the requirements were because the requirements weren't changing that much. They knew what they needed to do, but they were using a new technology platform. Alternatively, I've also seen teams uh, who had developed um, payment solutions for certain countries, and then, but they were moving into a new market, a new country, and they didn't know what the requirements for payments were in that new country. And it was actually a little a, a more difficult challenge. So in this case, this is usually where we need some kind of expert opinion, and we need to do some analysis to figure out what we need to do. And I'll talk a little bit about how we respond to these kind of problems in the future. Where does complexity fit? Well, it kind of fits here, where we don't really know what we need to build. We don't really know how to build it. And the people on the team don't really know if they're in agreement. This is a complex problem where we have a lot of these unknown unknowns. And I would argue that anyone on this call who's building a product that human beings are going to use is actually solving a complex problem because we can never figure out how human beings are going to respond to something we give them, right? We, can, we just can't do it. Um, there's also something here where if everything is totally uh, far from agreement or far from certainty, we're in this world of chaos. So this is the, the Stacy complexity matrix in a nutshell, and, and I know it's very fast, but I'm gonna bring over some elements of something called the Kneffen model. Kneffen is a Welsh word for habitat. This model was created by um, Dave, Dave Snowden. Um, and, and for simple or clear problems, the cause and effect relationship is obvious. We can use a standard practice. And the way we, we actually handle this is by sensing, we understand that there's a need, we understand that, that we need to do something. We can categorize it. For example, if we're working in a restaurant, we can categorize this as a, a drinks order or a food order, and then we can respond based on a standard operating procedure, right? So we can, we can do that. Um, and it's, and you know, what happens here is that if we start to apply some of the, the techniques that we need to apply to complex problems, it's a little bit overwhelming or it's a little bit of a, of, it's over-engineered and it makes people feel and wonder why are we doing all these things? And I'll talk a little bit about an example of that in a second. For complicated problems, the cause and effect relations are separated. They're not obvious. So I was talking about, you know, using Salesforce for CRM instead of whatever tool we were using. Well, we don't really know how to use Salesforce, but people know how to use it. There are experts out there who can help us understand how to use Salesforce. So we can come up with some different options, good practices. And the, the way we handle this is by sensing that we have a problem to solve. We can do some analysis. And then based on that analysis, we can respond. And the analysis may result in different options and things like that, but, but we can respond. 
Now, when it comes to the complex problems, our cause and effect is retrospectively coherent. I'm going to talk about what that means in a second. This is where we have emergent practices. And this is a totally different approach where we need to probe, sense, and respond. I'm going to talk a little bit more about, about all of these things in just a little bit. But I do want to talk about chaos. And I use the example, cause and effect are not perceivable. We've never seen anything like this before. It's an acute problem. We have to come up with some new way of, 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 of figuring out what to do. And instead of probing or analyzing, we just act. We need to act. We need to sense how that action has, has um, changed the problem or the problem space. And then based on our understanding of how what our action did and how we're sensing whether it worked or not, we can, we can come up with a better response. The example I use for some teams is what happens if, a, if we're in a, a meeting room and a tiger runs into the room, right? We, we've never had a tiger run into a meeting room before. And so, you know, Mark might punch the tiger in the nose. I might try to hide under the table. And Jennifer might run out the door. And maybe we'll find out that Jennifer running out the door did the smartest thing that could possibly happen. Yeah, okay, so Mark, it's okay. Maybe, you know, I don't know if I, anyone would punch the tire, really. Anyone, did anybody see cocaine bear, by the way? Because there is some punching of the bear in the, in the cocaine bear. Um, so, so this is where, you know, we, we do something. And I think early on um, in COVID, I think we were at this state, right, where we did not know what to do. Uh, there was a lot of uncertainty. It was chaos. Somebody just needed to do something. And based on what we, um, what we, what we learned from the actions that, that we took, as human beings, as governments, and things like that, um, we hopefully came up with a, a, a good response, overall response. I'm, I'm not going to argue that here today, one way or the other. But so, what I will say is that for simple problems, we don't need a, a methodology. We don't need to to sort of organize ourselves around a framework. And for complicated problems, where we can figure out what it is we need to do, analyze how to do it, and then respond, that is a perfect place for a more traditional approach like the waterfall, where we can figure out what our requirements are, our needs, figure out how to meet those needs based on our understanding of, of the sort of, or, or our reduction of uncertainty because of analysis, and then we can put a plan together and execute on it. Complex problems, though, require this notion of probing, sensing, and responding, and emergent practice. So what does retrospective coherence mean? Well, I'm going to bring our dear friend Steve Jobs into this. I'm not going to let you, or I'm not going to read this to you. You can all read it. Although that second sentence requires trust. And so when we're faced with uncertainty, we have to make decisions and trust that the dots are going to connect sometime in the future. Trust that it's going to work. And what I'd like to talk about today is finding ways that we can trust that we can that the dots will be connected. So that's one thing I'd like to talk about. So what is probing? So the easiest way to explain probing in this context is using an empirical or an experimental approach. And I don't know if anybody is a fan of the Muppets, but poor Beaker that, that was trying to test paper that was inflammable, supposedly, and it, it didn't work. But it was a nice experiment. But it, it sort of reflects what we see on the, on the right there, right? What people think success looks like and what it actually looks like is, uh, is not the same at all. And, and for those of us who've been involved in innovation and uh, solving these kind of complex, wicked problems, we know that um, we get this very, very difficult um, path to success, and it's very stressful. And this is what I'd like to talk about today. How do we, how do we reduce that, the stress involved in sort of proceeding up that line? Because there is, or that, that curve, because it is extremely stressful. So 
Let's talk about how Scrum deals with this. I think most of you know that, oops, the uh, em em empirical um, process in Scrum is supported by three pillars, transparency, inspection, and adaption, or adaptation. In this case, transparency on the left, what do we need to be transparent about? How about everything? How about everything? I, I once worked at a, a, a medical lab company here in Toronto, and I was, I was a, the team leader of a database team, and there were three other team leaders, and there was a, a manager, and he went away on vacation. And instead of nominating one of us uh, to go to the senior uh, management meeting, um, they invited all four of us to come. And so we started reporting our, our status to the, you know, the VPs. And it turned out, as we looked around the room at these VPs whose face, faces all went pale or were covered in sweat as we started to, that, that our manager was taking our not so great status reports and turning them green for the sake of, of his bosses. So we were, we were definitely in that waterfall or not waterfall, the watermelon kind of mode, right? Green on the outside and, and red in the middle. And that month changed that manager's life because he was not being transparent, we were being transparent, and from then on, transparency was expected. These were the days when, oh, this is so terrible, and it may still be happening in your lives. You know, we say, okay, we're gonna deliver by July 31st, and everything's green, 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 and then June 1st or June 7th, all of a sudden, we're not gonna deliver until October 31st, right? It's such a terrible feeling. It's, it's such a, a disservice to everyone in the organization. So there's all sorts of kinds of transparency, but you know, we have to be transparent about everything. And, and we want to be transparent so that we can inspect what was, what's going on and, and then adapt our approach based on what's happening. This picture on the right is a broadcasting company that I worked with. The people on the right are, the, are members of one of the teams that were solving a, an advertising sales problem. This problem had existed for 15 years, not solvable, and we put a couple of teams together, and within two months, the problem was solved. And, the, the, and, and this, this reduced the workload of advertising sales and, and sales associates um, by such an extreme amount that practically the entire sales team would come to the, the, the sprint reviews. And can you imagine how much inspection and adaptation came from having, what, 80 people, 100 people come to a sprint review and be extremely interested in what you're doing next and what you just did. So this is the kind of inspection and adaptation that we're talking about. And the team on the right, they knew every time they did one of these sprint reviews, there were going to be changes to what they were going to build next because they would learn a lot from the people doing the review. So that's what we're talking about here. Um, and how do we make this happen? So I want to talk about this, um, this law of requisite variety, which became known as the first law of cybernetics. And this is an adapted version of it. But this guy, Ross Ashby, a cyberneticist, cybernetics, the study of communications and, and control based on feedback in biological and artificial systems, big emphasis on comparing the way biological systems would respond and the way artificial systems would respond. But the gist of this law is that the more complex the operational environment, the more diverse the organization needs to be. And in a nutshell, only variety absorbs variety. And this was very interesting to me uh, as I learned about it because what, what it means is um, it's like a first principle of why we have some of the agile principles and practices that we have today. Instead of thinking about things just as, oh, I read it in the Agile Manifesto, it was a principle, or I read it in the Scrum Guide, this is a first principle about why we need to do some things. And I wanted to talk about a couple of those things. So first of all, whoops, oh, oh, sorry. Before I talk about those things, I wanna talk about what requisite diversity might mean in the context of sports. So 
I was living in Thailand when, when, I, when I first did a, a, a version of this presentation, and Aston Villa had just beaten Liverpool um, seven to two. Now, a lot of Thai people are Liverpool fans, and I brought this in just to sort of make them groan or laugh or hopefully something. And I'm, I'm going to bring up a couple of other examples, and I'll talk about what I mean by this in a second. You know, I'm, I'm living in Toronto. I'm a Blue Jays fan. Last year, Toronto beat Boston in Fenway Park 28 to 5. It's pretty ridiculous. Then last year, or this year, Liverpool beat Man U 7 0. This is ridiculous for Premiership football or, or um, a professional football in the UK. Look at this one. Does anybody remember when this happened? When the Seahawks beat the Cardinals 58 to nothing? That's um, like something else. And then the final one, which is totally ridiculous, was an indoor football game between, uh, I think, Erie and someone else, Chattanooga or something. But they beat, the, the, the Erie beat them 100 and what, 38 to zero. So what's the point here? When it comes to requisite variety, the Blue Jays had an incredible variety of plays and batting and the Boston Red Sox on that night did not absorb variety with variety. They did not have a, a variety of response that could handle what the Blue Jays were throwing at them or hitting at them. That's what this means. And so um, if when I think of all the agile transformations I've been part of and I've seen, we've heard of, many of them fail. And that's because the, the amount of variety and complexity um, that our organization and, our, and our, our customers throw at us in the midst of a transformation, if we don't have the type of variety that we need or diversity that we need to handle it, uh, we won't be successful at handling it. So let's talk about some ways that we can be successful at handling these things. So first of all, we need diverse cross-functional and self-organizing teams. It's the only way to solve for the variety of complex problems we face. And there are a couple of, one of them is a, princ a principle of the Agile Manifesto, the best architectures, requirements, and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. I would say that that statement at the top is one of the reasons why this is true. And scrum teams are cross-functional, meaning that we have all the skills necessary to create value. I would say that the diversity of cross-functional teams is one of the, the, the points here, that one of the reasons that we want cross-functional teams. And Dave Snowden, who you know, invented Kinefin, says, we need a diversity of interpretation of results as we go. We don't want groupthink. We need a diversity of opinion. And, and one of the things, um, so as soon as we bring a manager in, or a boss in, or a leader in, and that leader takes a look at maybe how long the team is taking in, at this point to sort of figure out what these results mean and interpret these results and says, why are you guys doing all this? It's clear, let's just do this. All of a sudden you've lost all your variety and your diversity. And so um, this is one of the things that we need to be, be very cognizant of. And this is why we need to be, um, why leaders need to learn because they, they usually haven't been part of an Agile team in their lives, why they need to learn what it takes to lead an Agile team. And yeah. So here's a diverse team. This is, this is the same team, a couple of teams actually, that were in that previous slide. They decided at um, Halloween that year to go as a, as a scrum board. And um, this was an incredibly diverse team because the organization took, and you can't see it here. I mean, you can see diversity here, right? But there's even more diversity than what's what's visible uh, on in this picture. Some of these people are business people who came from um, either sales all the way through to um, um, the control, like uh, mission control. Um, there are people from vendors here. There are technologists here. There is such a diversity of of sort of experience here. And 
this is the team that started solving these problems in a couple of months that had existed for, for 15 years. How did they do that? Because, you know, if we think of the Tuckman model, forming, storming, norming, and performing, a lot of storming was expected here. So how did we deal with that storming as it came up? Because we knew it was going to happen. So how did we deal with it? So the first thing is we, we made, we had this emphasis on psychological safety. So if anybody's seen this, the project Aristotle from, from uh, Google, uh, the rework research, uh, you know, they find, they found five factors that enabled high performing teams. Um, but of the five, psychologically, psychological safety was by far the most important. That notion of never having any interpersonal fear, being able to express your opinion without ever feeling judged or being judged, um, to be able to make it make a decision with the team, knowing that, you know, this decision is not the end of the world and that everybody's comfortable with each other. It's, it's incredibly powerful. And in my experience as a coach, forget all the other agile practices, forget all the other things. Um, my goal is to, is to help a team or an organization build psychological safety. And if we do that, and we're diverse, we can handle anything as long as we're competent in our in our basic, um, you know, skills and things like our, our jobs, we can do anything. Um, and even the competence, you know, even the NASA, the, the operations arm of NASA when it started, they didn't hire experienced people. They hired people right out of university to, to, to be there. Um, so just very interesting. So psychological safety, absolutely important. How do we do it? So I think you've probably seen this in the context of maybe the pyramid and then the right side. That's um, Patrick Lencioni's uh, five dysfunctions of a team. I, didn't, I don't like calling anything five dysfunctions. It, it's, it's very hard to go into a team and say, hey, we're gonna talk about five dysfunctions of a team. I, so what I did was I, I created this balance on the left to say, when you've got it, here's what things look like. When it's lacking, here's what things look like. Um, and then I actually do retrospectives where we ask people to sort of figure out where are we on this on this uh, spectrum from the left to the right. So, you know, trust in this case at the bottom is not the kind of predictive trust that comes from knowing somebody for a long time where, you know, I, I, I might know Mark for, for years and I, I know I can trust that he's going to react in a certain way. I may not like that way, but I kind of know how he's going to react. Trust in this case is all about being able to be vulnerable, um, show our own weaknesses, own up to mistakes. Um, and that's how we build psychological safety. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna share some things, some practices that I use as a coach that help build trust. Leading by example. So remember I said, I'm kind of nervous talking, I'm in Mark's house. It's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to be nervous. When you're when you're when you're here, um, and it's okay to admit it. And if you keep doing it, I find as an agile coach, if I keep admitting that I don't know exactly what's going on here, holy cow! That project that Mark and I worked on, we were using AWS um, EC2 Cloud for the first time ever. I had no idea what was going on, um, but we all learned together. And oh boy, we were all pretty vulnerable together at that point, trying to figure out what was going on. And and it was okay to own up to it. Pair programming. So you're sitting beside a developer you do not know because your team is just formed and you're pair programming. It doesn't get any more vulnerable than that. Why aren't you using the enhanced for loop? What the heck is going on here, right? So let it, let it happen um, and, and let, it, let yourself be vulnerable. Admitting blockers. So, you know, we talk about the daily scrum. We talk about making sure that, that we admit blockers or even admitting them anytime during the day. When I was in Thailand, I used to ask people, how long before, how long will it be before you admit a blocker? And in general, it was a day. People would say, I'd, I'd work on something for a day before I admitted it. And so, you know, we said, well, what if you just admitted it within 15 minutes? See if anybody on the team can help you. Imagine how much that'll accelerate your work and how now we start to say, okay, I'm admitting blockers. We're all gonna help each other solve these problems. So. Three techniques for building trust. The retrospective, the good old retrospective is great for building trust, 
because we have to be vulnerable in that retrospective that maybe we're admitting that we're, that something went wrong and we want to figure out together how we can fix it. But it's also great for conflict. So high performing teams need to be very, very um, comfortable with conflict, not interpersonal, you're a jerk conflict, but the conflict required to resolve issues and bring up and bring up different uh, opinions about how to solve a problem um, without becoming interpersonal. And I'll tell you one way that I use and uh, to, to introduce healthy conflict very early on in, in my coaching with the team is planning poker and t-shirt sizing. If you facilitate planning pro poker in a great way and you, you start to see that people are groaning or rolling their eyes or, or not believing somebody, you can coach that team into what, what those behaviors mean to the person for whom they're rolling their eyes. And you can help them build a great, um, a great uh, healthy conflict together. Planning poker is an estimation technique. If you want to hang around afterwards, we, we can talk about it. Um, backlog refinement is also great. Like, you know, if we, when we come in, a product owner comes in with a bunch of new stories or something, and we start doing backlog refinement, and we start estimating the size of the stories and agreeing on acceptance criteria, you know, we're going to break those stories down. Um, the product owner might say, well, I, I don't want to eliminate that acceptance criterion from that story. But actually, as we all learn to work together, this is a way for agile teams to, to sort of build trust and have healthy conflict. And whoops, and when it comes to commitment, Team planning is fantastic. This is where it's not just the product owner and the scrum master doing the planning, it's the team. And I think we all know that it's more of a design exercise than it is a planning exercise, um, but let's see how that goes. All right, I know I'm skipping through these things quickly. I'm, I'm realizing that I'm gonna run out of time. Um, so let me, let me go on to the next slide. Let's talk about the five S's. So you did, you, if you played the game, you went through the five S's, and let's talk about what the, uh, what the S's mean in real life. So first, remember this terrible situation. We have 100 tiles. We have to come up with 1 through 50 uh, in order. That's very exemplary of what happens in our real day work. We've got work coming at us from email, from Slack, on the phone, WebEx. We're not organized. Finding the next thing to work on is tough. So maybe what we do is we sort. Remember, we removed anything above 50 from the board. Makes it easier to find the one through 50. I love the word no. And um, this could be just basic prioritization. Let's say no so that we're not, so that the signal is not lost in the noise. We don't care about the things above 50. So let's just, let's just lose them. Let's clear our board. The next one, which, whoops, um, some people, I know it's, it's maybe not a great visual, but, you know, the way it works is that in the different quadrants that, you know, like the top left, there's one and then two and three across to the right, and then it goes down. And then once you're, once you finish the bottom right, you go back to the top left again and, and keep going a little easier to find. Um, yes, I will, I will share the, the PowerPoint. Um, so maybe we are doing big room planning and we're figuring out what we're going to do in the next two to three months. It's not certain, but let's, um, let's make sure that, that we've got things kind of organized, right? So these are the things that might come up. But then we talk about standardize. And this is where everybody found it very easy to click through. Um, oh, yeah, Minta, let's talk about it later. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, just, it's just this visual representation of, of, of straightening and shining. But the last one, I think you'll all agree that on the last one, you got pretty close to 50 if you didn't get 50, right? Because you know exactly where everything is and what's coming up. That's just like having a force rank backlog, right? We all know exactly what's coming up. And so um, that's standardizing. So let's talk about how, oh, and then we've got to sustain it. So that's the fifth S. You need to have self-discipline. You, you've got to keep doing this to keep, to keep everything standardized. You've got to keep doing it and doing it, doing it. It takes a lot of work. Um, so 
let's talk about agile meetings. So maybe we do quarterly or big room or, or program increment planning. Maybe you do that um, where we're, we're looking at what might come up in, t in chunks. Now we do backlog refinement. We're, now we're, we're creating this four strength backlog, right? And we can, we can change the order just about at any time. And now maybe we do sprint or iteration planning where we're picking the items that we're gonna work on and complete this sprint. So now everybody knows, forget about anything above, above 10. We know exactly what we're doing for this sprint. And then that leaves our product owner to be able to change the order of anything above 10, because we're not worried about that right now. And then in our daily scrum or our huddle or our Kanban meeting, maybe we're only talking about um, the, the ones that we're working on right now, very limited number. So that's the, that's, when you think about solving complex problems, what we've just talked about is let's build a psychologically safe team that is resilient to adversity. Let's give them this approach that simplifies how they organize their work, which makes it easier to sort of think about solving the complex problems because our, our approach is quite simple. Now, I wanna talk about a technique for shifting left with risk. We always talk about shifting left with um, testing, right? So we're identifying our test cases up front um, and then developing to deliver our, uh, our, our tests in a passing state. I call this day pessimistic day. Now, I've had people tell me, Dave, that sounds so negative, but it's the only day that you can be negative on, a, on an agile, in an agile effort, or maybe every, every now and then, right? Similar to a future perspective where we sort of think about what might, like if we're thinking six months from now um, or a year from now, our project has failed or our product has failed to deliver the outcomes that we expected. What went wrong? So we've got to get our initial backlog to a state where it's good enough, where we think that people will be able to understand what our, what our product um, is going to do and what it's going to be. Then we invite the people that we typically call the troublemakers, the ones who, when we've got everything ready to go, they come in and say, no, you can't go live because of this or this or this, right? Well, that's legal compliance risk. I'm not gonna read all of those, those names out, but you know that, that these people are the ones who are absolutely necessary in a large organization for us to get agreement to deploy our working software to production in a safe way, a safe and secure way. Uh, we need those people. Now, um, at the end of this deck, there is some guidance on what these people need to think about. We need to give them some visual cues about how to identify the kinds of risks that, um, that, that we're talking about. And so you can see on the top right, um, there's a little bit of a, um, a schedule there of, of how this works. People are all identifying risks and you see that they're dot voting. I'm gonna talk about the dot votes in a second. And on the bottom, that's the people identi initially identifying risks. These are all the people that you usually don't meet with until too late in a project to be able to do anything about what they've talked about, right? So we wanna meet them early on. So we meet them, we identify the risks, and then what we do is we dot vote. And you know that every risk has uh, probability. How probable is it that this is, how likely is it that this is gonna occur? And an impact. What's the degree of, of negative impact if this risk actually manifests itself? And so what we do is we allow the people, again, and, it, and for using Miro or, or Mural, it's actually great because it can be anonymous. Um, but if we're dot voting, people can dot vote on the, the risks that they think are most highly likely. They dot vote on the left. And the ones that they think are the most impactful, they, they dot vote on the right. And they try to ignore what's on the left when they're doing what's on the right and what's on the right when they're doing what's on the left. So forget about the impact when you're thinking about probability, only think about probability. Um, so we, we do that. And then as you can see in this particular case, a subset of these risks were identified as the most, uh, as the, the, the highest exposure. So then you can see that there's a backlog here. And what we do is we map those risks to the stories that we think that if we can deliver those stories, we will reduce the risk. 
And you can see that there are a couple of stories that have multiple risks associated with them. So what that means is that instead of just prioritizing our backlog or ranking our backlog by value and size, um, we we also add risk into it and we readjust our, our um, ranking based on risk. But we do it very explicitly. And I'll tell you what that results in. It results in a risk curve that looks like this. In our traditional or waterfall approach, we're just ready to go live with a beautiful product that we've delivered. And now the legal and compliance and, and risk people come in and, and the marketing people, and they tell us why we can't go live or the enterprise architects. Um, but when we use this approach, we end up focusing on reducing risk and every sprint in our sprint review, we might actually have a little section where we talk about whether we reduced risks or not. And so we can focus on risk. And what that means is that on a traditional project, it's a terrible feeling at the end, where on an agile, in an agile world, it's kind of a terrible feeling at the beginning. Because now we're thinking, oh gosh, these people just brought up all of these risks that we didn't think of when we created our backlog, and now we have to handle these things. And sometimes it means adding new user stories. Well, that's the whole point about shifting left. Let's add the new user stories early on so that we can handle the risks instead of waiting until the end where it's too late. Now, this is something that I've done over and over again. And I, you know, it's funny, I, my last work was at a, a, a bank here in Canada that I worked at like four and a half years ago. I, I, I called it pessimistic day. We did it. One of those pictures is of that bank. And, um, then I, you know, when I was working, I met with that team and they, they don't call it pessimistic day anymore. They call it the pessimist session and they still do the same thing. And they, they actually built a whole, um, risk liaison team to work with product owners to make sure that all of the risks identified had some kind of control in place in the backlog. And it's very collaborative and proactive. And it's, it's enabled that, the, that organization to deliver products much more quickly than, um, than they could in the past when risk would be identified kind of throughout or at the end. Okay. There's a quiz now. Is everybody ready for the quiz? And yeah, we're going to give away this book. So I don't know how, you know, I'm going to find out um, how, how well I did at presenting, but here's the Slido. I'm going to go to, so I see that Mark has joined the quiz. I'm going to wait until a few of you have joined and then we'll start the quiz. This is really a test for Dave to see how well he, uh, how uh, well, how well I presented yeah. more than it is the people, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's not a test of anybody else. It's a test of me. See if I was able to explain things. And there's only, there's only, a, I, I don't know how many people are on right now, Mark, but there's space for a hundred people in the quiz. Oh yeah. So if, if you want to win the book, you got to be beat out the other 52 people. Kind of like Jennifer escaping the room while I was punching the tiger and winning in that way. That's right. <laughs> okay. So we're, uh, that book was one that, um, Dave had recommended. So if you're the winner, send me a screenshot and we will get a copy of that book yep. in your direction. And this is the book. The reason I like it, um, Steve Denning, he, I'll tell you the, I'll tell you what, what he's really saying in this book. He's really saying, let's forget about, uh, shareholder value and let's focus on customer value as, uh, as, as capitalists, let's make sure that we give value to our customers. And, and so in, in some ways it reduces that stress of, um, some outside party looking at us and how we're doing in the short term and letting us think in the long term, right? About delivering what our customers need. Okay. So are we ready to go? Should we count down? I say count down. We've got a few people straggling in, but I think it's time to play. Okay. Let's play. All right. So. First question, how to handle complex problems in the Kinefin framework?
Is it counting down? Whoops. There we go. Maybe I did that too fast. So does the next slide show us whether we the next were right slide should, Yeah, so so let me yeah. show the next slide. I, I thought, okay, so this is the first time I'm, I'm doing this live, but the answer is probe sets respond. There we go, 41% 41 of, 41 of you got it right, that's great. Um, and uh, let's go on to the next question then. Let's see the leaderboard first. Oh, so it's the same as you, Mark. The leaderboard is not showing up. Okay, it's a secret. It's a secret. Keep everybody in suspense. Okay, so which of these did the Gemini project not need to prove? Where's the timer? Heavens. Okay, so I'll just wait until. Okay, so I'm gonna. All right, so it is can astronauts fly in space? That's because Mercury had already proved that. So that's the answer for that one. And let's go to the next question. This is a fill in the blanks question. The more complex the operational environment, the more blank the organization needs to be. This is a kind of a trick question, the way I worded this, by the way. I think it's interesting thinking about what people knew back in um, about trying to go to the moon. I remember reading a, like a kid's science book that I found in an old garage. They were saying, we're going to try to land on the moon someday. We're not sure it might be made out of gunpowder or mm. it might just sink down into it. And, you know, it made me appreciate how much was not known at that point. That's true. There was a lot not known. Okay, we'll go on to, let's see if how people did. Okay, so that's great because it is... Um, called the the law of requisite uh, requisite variety and um, and diverse is the right answer. That's great. Although, see, it's a trick question because transparency is also very important. Okay, last question. Oh, there's the countdown. About ten seconds left. Which desired team behavior can agile estimation reinforce? So the answer is actually conflict. Um, now, that was in what I presented. Of course, it reinforces trust. It's just in the slide that I showed, it was associated with conflict. Um, okay, let's see if we get a leaderboard. There we go. Tom. Congratulations, Tom. Congratulations, Tom. So. <laughs> Hey, so Tom, send me a screenshot or just send me an email and uh, we'll get we'll get a copy of the book to you. He, somebody else was asking what the name of the book was uh, again. Reinventing Capitalism in the Digital Age. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So thanks everybody for coming. Thanks, Mark, for having me. Hope this helped. Very cool. We'll share the slides. Yes, thank you, Rebecca. I will send out some slides. Also, people were asking about a recording. It will be up at um, YouTube Agile LNN. Let me put this here. It probably is there right now, just about 60 seconds delayed. So you can go watch it again right now if you want. Uh, but I'll get edited and post it up there too and send links out to either later today or maybe tomorrow. So be watching for that. And um, Dave, thank you so much for coming. Um, there was somebody you had a few people you had mentioned sticking around and asking answering some questions at the end. So I'm gonna stick around for a while so it doesn't boot anyone out. Um thanks everybody for coming. Hope to see you next week. We're gonna be talking about uh counter espionage on agile teams, which is gonna be a lot of fun. Okay, thank you. Yeah, if anybody has any questions, um I can stick around for a bit. And I saw Julie there for a while. Julie, did you disappear? <coughs> There's Excellent workshop, David. Hi, Minton. How are you? I'm good.
So I got to leave, but that was great. Thanks. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Bye bye. Any other questions, concerns, aggravations, comments about how to escape tigers? <laughs> Hi, Barb. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Just wanted to say hi. Yeah, Doesn't no. Have any tigers yet? Well, see, Barb. Barb, I worked with Barb uh, last year, Mark, and she she heard that tiger explanation already. Okay. Yeah. Well, at least you're prepared. I evidently wasn't. I tried to punch it. <laughs> I did. Yeah, well. Yeah. So anyway, how how are things, Barb? Did this resonate with you? Was this? Yeah, no, this was great. It's great. I I um, I've actually I'm on a secondment right now, so I'm out of the lab, but I like to stay in touch mm. with with state because I'm going back. It'll be about a year, but I'm going back. But uh, yeah, so I just I stay in touch with all of these sessions and with people in the lab so that I don't lose my mojo. Okay, that's good. <laughs> that's good. Oh, I was very excited to see you were presenting though. So that was awesome. Oh no, that's good. Thanks for coming. And there's so this is there Jeff Braxton has just appeared. So Jeff, Mark, and I worked together back in 2011 and 12. Hey Jeff, haven't seen you in a while. I came I came on to play panning poker uh, planning poker. I was having flashbacks when you mentioned. Me. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Played that with us too, Jeff. <laughs> but, and and it's you know the thing is that when I when I when I we first play it, we just say let's just play planning poker and give some rules and let's do it. And and as the team gets used to doing it, I then I start to start to say okay now see what we've done here uh, since the first time. Everybody is is just giving their explanation. Very, it's nobody's worried about what anybody else thinks. We just use the explanation, learn from it, actively listen, and then um, vote again, right? And um, and as a team, as you start to see the team actively listening to each other and and respecting each other's opinions, and, and the votes start to change, uh, then you can start to talk to them about how <clears throat> how they've developed an approach to healthy conflict, and then you can say, let's try to use this in some other uh, other aspects of how we work too. Joy was just yeah. asking about that in the in the chat. Ah, uh, about just about that. What I just said, right? You said you mentioned using planning poker and estimation for resolving healthy conflicts. How mm. do you? How would you do that? Yeah. So I think what you just explained. So I mean, you know, one thing that you see in initial planning poker is people um, literally not listening to each other. I worked with this with this one team, and there was.